I recently bought this Asus ROG Strix X670E-I gaming Wi-Fi mini ITX board. <laughs> wow, what a mouthful. And there's a ton to go over with this board. And so in this video, I'll be doing a fairly technical overview of the board itself, looking at the cooling solution and the engineering that went into this, as well as draw your attention to a couple of things that you may need to consider if you're looking at buying this board, because things are just a little bit different for this generation. So yes, guys, this is Asus's new Strix ROG Mini ITX board. This board retails for 469 US or 639 Canadian, which is a hefty price to pay for any board. So let's dive in and check out what makes this little brick tick. Right off the bat, it's using the newest top of the line X670E chipset. The E at the end of X670 being for extreme, which means you have access to the, all the features available for the Ryzen 7000 platform. It's common for X670 non-E boards to only have four PCIe 5.0 lanes, commonly used for storage. Connectivity aside, the X670E boards with the Extreme moniker and all tend to have better CPU power delivery, but not always. If we compare power delivery on this ITX offering to a high-end X670E ATX offering, also from Asus, you'll see more power phases on the full-size board simply because there's more space to deploy a higher phase VRM. I'm not really experienced enough to say for certain, but if you want the absolute highest overclocks, I might think you'd wanna go for a high-end full-size board, but that's not to say that you can't push the clocks and power on this thing. I mean, just look at this cooling setup. They're using not one, but two small fans built into the heatsink assembly. This one focusing on more cooling the VRM, which is the power delivery circuit for the CPU, and this one back here focusing more on the storage area over here. Inside the storage area, we have room for two M.2 drives. They've gone with a space saving design, stacking these drives on top of each other using this little riser here, which is great for density, fitting more storage into the same footprint on the board. However, that wouldn't be so good if they didn't come up with a way to get the heat out of the drives under heavy read write loads. And that's where these heat sink platforms come in. This setup looks very adequate, and on the surface, I have no doubt the cooling solution will prove effective. Looking over this way, we can see the other part of the main cooling solution of the board, which is the heatsink more responsible for cooling the VRM. At first glance, this may look like one big heatsink assembly. However, these two cooling areas are not physically attached, and they cool their respective components individually. My first thought when I saw this board was like, Oh no, <laughs> tower air cooler compatibility may prove to be an issue with this. So what, is everyone just supposed to use an AIO? And luckily the answer is no, at least I don't think so. <laughs> so here is my Noctua D15. I just have it sitting on there right now, but as you can see, it fits like a glove. They also have this little rubber area here, which I think is so funny that they would do this. It just seems janky and cheap. But what I think that's for is to improve cooler compatibility to some degree. If you had like large heat sink pipes or something that came out of a cooler this way, this little rubber squishy area would bend out of the way and allow for proper mounting of some coolers or maybe even certain AIO tubes in certain cases or something. By the way, I will have a video building this into an ITX case soon with a lower profile knock to an air cooler using this 7950X. So get subscribed if you wanna see how to make that work. Uh, you won't wanna miss that one. Moving on, let's look at the eight pin EPS power connector on top of the board, because I actually think there was some thought put in here. You'll see it has this metal shroud on it, it says ProCool. And if you can believe Asus's marketing, this helps with cooling the connector and cuts down on electrical impedance. As you push more power through a wire of a given size, it will heat up and it will heat up firstly at area of higher resistances. The most common area of higher resistance in our computers is the actual connections where anything is plugged in. When you have two metal pins inside an electrical connector and they're touching like this, it's not quite as good of a contact as a continuous strand of wire like what you would find inside your power supply cables, meaning it takes a little more oomph to get it across that connection. Any loss of energy across that imperfect connection will be converted into waste energy in the form of heat. The catch is that as the connection heats up, it actually adds even more resistance into the equation, requiring even more oomph to flow the same power across the connector 
and so on and so on. And eventually, if you try to draw too much power across the connection, the connector can melt. So in this case, Asus is adding some sort of cooling to the connector to try and combat that increase in resistance that happens when the CPU is sucking back 300 watts or more in an overclocking situation, say. This board also uses a 10 layer PCB, which is a load of copper and it ends up working like a heat sink to some degree, soaking up any heat generated by the board itself and dispersing that throughout the board. Ideally, you would just use two eight pin EPS power connections because then you would effectively split the load in half and only have half the power flowing through each connector. However, real estate is at a premium when we're talking about ITX form factor, so that's why they don't do that. Just a quick side, guys, if you're enjoying this video, please take one second and drop me a like. I see all your likes and comments and consider subscribing for more PC hardware videos in the future. Anyway, speaking of real estate, you'll notice there's no integrated audio solution on this board. Asus has opted to implement an external sound solution, and let me just grab that. So Asus has opted for an external sound solution they're calling Strix Hive, which at its core is the components that you would normally find built into the motherboard, but now they're externalized with a few goodies slapped on. These goodies include a volume dial with a click to mute functionality, BIOS flashback button, PBO toggle off on, a flex key that is by default set as a reset button. Your QLEDs have been moved off board. That's your little lights that show you what's going on as the system boots up. So anyway, they are now here. USB 2 port with BIOS flashback, USB 3.2 type C, USB type C power and data connection for actually connecting the hive itself to the motherboard. And finally, we have a headphone out mic in jack and a mic in optical spdiff out. Another space saving compromise they had to make is this little guy in the box here. Behold, the Asus ROG FPS2 card. Effectively, this is a little chunk of motherboard that has the rest of the features they just couldn't fit into the ITX form factor. So from top down, we have USB 2.0 internal ports, your front panel connection header, clear CMOS and CPU over voltage headers, your alteration mode switch, which is for manually setting PCIe generation signal from your CPU between 3.0 and 4.0 to your PCIe X16 slot, or you just leave it in auto to use your CPU's default speed, which in Ryzen 7000 series is generation five. So the alteration switch is kind of cool feature to possibly increase compatibility with some older GPUs or risers or other devices. We also have two internal SATA six gigabit per second ports. Now it's time to talk about what's mounted on the main board PCB itself. We have your usual CPU, AIO and system fan headers. RGB Gen 2 header, Asus Aura Sync header, two DDR5 DIMM slots supporting up to 6400 mega transfers per second signaling, your 24 pin connector, USB 3.2 Gen 2 internal connection. There's some space here for that ROG FPS2 card, which fits on something like that. That's just these two little connections here. Uh, USB 3.2 Gen 1, there's also another power button header in addition to the one that's found on the FPS2 card. That's neat if you can't fit the FPS2 card in some edge use case or something and you still wanna be able to turn your system on with a normal case button. There's also a thermal sensor header just beside it. And finally, that brings us to the IO area in the back here. We can see a solid mounted IO shield. Gone are the days of flimsy mounted IO shields that never fit into a case properly. Check out this ventilation. We can see two vented areas positioned around where those little fans are on the heatsink. Going over the other ports here on the back, all the red USB ports are USB 3 10 gigabit per second ports. And I like how they're all labeled just above the ports. So you don't have to go searching for a manual to find out what USB ports do what speed. This one little port down here that's red with a USB type C connection symbol is the one that you have to use for the Strix Hive, which you also have to make sure is enabled in the BIOS for it to work which apparently, I haven't checked this yet, but in the user's manual, uh, Strix Hive in the BIOS is called Hydronode USB. Are you confused yet? I sure am. <laughs> Moving along, we have HDMI out, which is nice, especially if you end up repurposing this board sometime later in the future for like a home theater PC or something. 
We also have two USB 4.0 type C ports that will do 40 gigabit per second. You can also do display over these ports. Uh, I heard or read somewhere that these will do two 4K displays simultaneously, or you can run one single 8K resolution display off if you're only using one of these ports. But going through the user's manual, I can't actually see a spec for them. It just says that they support display. So sorry if you're looking for specifics on those. It also has three USB 2.0 ports, 2.5 gigabit ethernet, and antenna headers for your onboard Wi-Fi 6E. So that's all I can really say about this ITX board from Asus. Super feature dense and some new concepts about how they're handling fitting so much into a small form factor, but what do you guys think? Did I answer any questions you might have had if you're shopping for a new ITX board? I read all your comments, so drop them below and don't forget to like this video if you got value from it. And please subscribe for more PC tech videos coming soon.